It is called Words Matter on the debate over free speech, inclusivity, and academic excellence. And if you look, and I'm not going to read the whole thing aloud here, but if you look at who they appear to be, that's not good, um, um, who they appear to be responding to, who they cite, it's Krylov's original piece and two pieces that she has published since then with some other co-authors. So it really does seem to be a response in kind, and these are um, also you know, other chemists. Let's just start with the first two paragraphs from this piece. Again, uh, published, I think it's July, I think it's last month in the same journal, Journal of Physical Chemistry Letters. What do we value as an academic and a scientific community, they ask. Do our core values include only the pursuit of facts and inventions to the exclusion of other considerations? Or do we accept that scientists have a responsibility to serve society beyond simply expanding the knowledge base, and should therefore concern themselves, at least in part, with how their words and actions intersect and impact the human sphere? A, science, a scientist's innovations might be profound, benefiting many, but if that person's words or actions create an alienating or hostile workplace or learning environment, then how should the scientific community evaluate that person's overall contribution to humanity? How should society view such a person? These questions lie at the heart of an emerging conversation regarding what equality means for the greater scientific enterprise as we pursue increased diversity and inclusion of underrepresented groups at our universities. So I have a number of little excerpts to share from this, uh, but I know you have something to say here. Let me just comment on this particular excerpt first. Right off the bat here, they have created a straw man. The idea that Dr. Krylov is interested uh, or it doesn't care, doesn't has has not a care for the creation of an alienating or hostile work environment, is patently false, and it is a straw man position. Which once you hear that, if you imagine that these people who are scientists and therefore should know something about what a complete solution set of hypotheses on the table looks like. If you hear this and you take it to be, well, there's two positions, and obviously I don't like a hot, the idea of a hostile work environment, and if you're saying that's fine with you, then I'm in the other camp. I'm on the other side. And that's not what the, that's not what the landscape actually looks like, right? It, is, it has never looked like that. And one of the ways that that is a false representation of what those of us who are resisting diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, measures are saying is that your measures are actually making the problem worse. Many of us can see that there certainly has been, and to some degree remains, problems with systemic racism, sexism, etc. But the idea that believing anyone's feelings as soon as they speak them out loud, and that trusting those feelings to be representative of what needs to happen in order to make it better, is the way to make a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive society is, for most of us who are speaking out about it and have thought about it carefully, exactly the opposite of what you should be doing. So the straw man is not just a straw man, it's actually the opposite of what is true in many regards. Yeah, it's the it's the inverse of right, yeah. which uh, increasingly the inverse of right is something that we have to watch for. Anytime you see it, it's an indicator that some process is afoot that is not the one that is being described. Yes. Um, I would point out a couple things. One, uh, I have come to detest awards. Mm. And the reason that I've come to detest awards is that they always get hijacked, right? The purpose of awards, at least in principle, is a noble one. The idea is you want to take something like Dr. Krylov's uh, courageous point and you want to add a benefit to having made it, especially one that's unexpected, that then will embolden such a person to continue to do such a thing and will show others, hey, this might be a, a scary thing to say out loud, but it does get noticed and it gets noticed in a way that's actually something you can put on your CV, Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So the potential benefit to awards is huge yes. as the benefit to something like tenure that protects a person who has contributed at a certain level so that they can be free to say uncomfortable, difficult things. Mm -hmm. But what happens to these things is they are equally useful mm -hmm. as a mechanism for emboldening those who shouldn't be emboldened. Yes. And uh, so anyway, um, in this case, it sounds like USC gave a proper award. Mm -hmm. This isn't a case of the corruption, but I will say that the flip side of this predicts the story here. Mm. The flip side <coughs> of the award situation is spite. 
And mm. uh, we're going to get to the technical definition here in a second. But the point is when somebody like Dr. Krylov makes a point like this one in a way that is then recognized by her university, then the danger she poses to the false uh, whatever the contents of the box labeled diversity, equity, and inclusion is, the threat she poses is that much greater. That's what the award is for, mm. right? The award is for speaking uh, truth to some kind of cryptic illegitimate power. Mm -hmm. And so the cryptic illegitimate power And now, to prompt conversation. Right, to prompt conversation, yes. to defuse the bomb, right? To the extent that this bomb allows... Well, but, even, but even if she were wrong... That's what I'm saying. Right, Like, it, but, but maybe... maybe She's not in this case, but even if she were wrong, and what it does is prompt conversation and allows for a greater understanding of the basis on which the original communication were wrong, that that is worthy of of high notice as well, because that is what we are trying to do: is we discuss in order to discover, we discuss 100%. in order to discover. And the the folks who are engaged in this illegitimate revolution know that what they have to do is make conversation impossible. Yes. Right? Here are the things you have to believe, and conversation about whether that's the things that you really do have to believe has to become impossible. Those are the two necessary things. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that somebody steps in and says, actually, I can discuss these things, right? I'm not afraid to discuss race. I'm not afraid to discuss gender, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not afraid to discuss history and what our obligations based on it are. That person is an extra threat. And so now we get to this question of what spite is. Spite is something that has been carefully considered inside evolutionary biology. And the basic point is spite is the acceptance of a cost in order to inflict a cost, right? Mm -hmm. And that may sound bizarre, right? Why are you interested in inflicting costs? And why would you accept a cost? That sounds like just it's all bad, right? And it is. Inside the matrix of uh, costs and benefits, why would you accept a cost to inflict a cost? Mm -hmm. Because the cost to you of not doing so is larger in the long term. Now, this makes a lot more sense if you think in terms of lineages. But if you have a person who is profiting by doing bad things, it may be expensive to make it difficult for them to continue. Mm -hmm. That's, I'm going to accept a cost in order to inflict a cost. Policing is the acceptance of a cost. We in civilization pay to have police. What police do is they drive up the cost of committing crimes, mm -hmm. right? So what we want is for crime not to pay. If crime doesn't pay, we won't see it. And how do you make crime pay? Well, you have a certain number of people paid to find the criminals and make sure that they are punished. And it doesn't have to be 100%. It just has to be enough that engaging in crime is not a wise thing to do, right? So the point is, when somebody like Dr. Krylov steps into the fray and says, actually, based on what I've seen, I know what we need to be talking about, and I'm going to show you that it can be done, mm -hmm. the necessity for those engaged in this illegitimate revolution to punish her is going to be uh obvious and so, so at some level this this newest uh this newest article uh was inevitable something was certainly going to fill that space and that it happens to be an article that it happens to, happens to have been written by the people it was written by who knows whatever the point is it could have been anything but what must not stand is oh she said this daring thing and then got an award Maybe we should say daring things. Maybe we'll get awards, right? Mm -hmm. That can't stand. Mm -hmm. So you can expect that there will be somebody is going to come up with something to rob that award of its power to make this behavior more calm. Um, so, <coughs> yeah, so I would argue that trajectory is inevitable. Mm -hmm. The particulars are not. Okay. But this is exactly what happened to us, too, right? Because we had a community of people because it was uh, diverse in every regard, right? We had trans people in our community at Evergreen. You're talking about our students, right? your professors. Yep. We had trans people. We had people of many different races. We had wide economic diversity amongst our students, and they were all thrilled to be doing what we were doing together. And so that was a danger to the story that Evergreen had a terrible problem with white supremacy, that it was impossible for students of color to get a decent education, blah, 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 blah. We had to be punished, and we were. So I would mm -hmm. just say yep. we need to zoom out and notice that transition. Somebody shows it can be done. Somebody has to punish them for doing so. Fascinating. Yeah. Okay, let me read uh, another small section from this uh, just published article again by... Sorry, I've forgotten the name. It's um, Herbert et al. in the Journal of Physical Chemistry Letters. Unnaming the buildings, this two-paragraph section is called. 
Recently, four buildings at the University of California, Berkeley, were, an, were unnamed following a substantive and transparent process that acknowledged both the eponymous individual's contributions to their disciplines and to the university, but also their considerable flaws. In each of these four cases, it was ultimately concluded that the latter outweigh the former and that the individuals in question can no longer be viewed as exemplifying the values that the university seeks to champion. For example, a building formerly known as LeConte Hall was a historical honor bestowed in recognition of John LeConte, Berkeley's first faculty member and its first acting president. Yet LeConte was also known as a virulent racist. Other institutions are also undertaking the difficult but necessary work to recognize the implications and significance of honorific building names. Our values, our priorities, and our biases are reflected in those we choose to honor, and our community sends a message about institutional values when it renames or unnames a lecture, an award, or a building. This is not canceling, but rather recalibrating. Institutions and institutional values evolve over time, and the people who those institutions choose to exalt should evolve in tandem. We need to consider our appellations wisely, aiming for enduring values and acknowledging that decisions made in the past may no longer reflect who we are or who we aspire to be as a scientific and an academic community. Let me read the choices sentence one more time, italics in the original. This is not canceling, but rather recalibrating. Yes, that is now if a If that term. doesn't sound totalitarian and newspeaky, I don't know what does. Yeah, it's another term where uh, a term that we used to be able to use that was highly effective for which there is no obvious synonym, right, is now compromised by the fact that it is going to be used as a weapon. And so, uh, you know. Well, and you can't, I mean, obviously things decalibrating. Right. We know that. We're scientists. We know that we've got to recalibrate our stuff every now and then. So sometimes our names need to be recalibrated. Recalibrating. Yeah. Um, but it's clever. I mean, yeah. I'll give them that. <laughs> yeah. No, stupid they're not. Um, they, I'll just read a few more things for us okay. to riff on. They say uh, in the next section, yeah, they say in the next section here about a number of journals, and I'm not going to go into the background of exactly which journals they're talking about, but they say, these journals do not censor new science or scientific disagreements and thus remain aligned with their primary purpose. Now, on what basis are they claiming that journals do not censor new science or scientific disagreements? They have no basis. And in fact, they tell a story in here about a paper having been, they say, uh, retracted. And in fact, they're, they're misspeaking. And I'm not going to go into to that story here. But they are, being, they are playing very fast and loose with both Im you know, immediate past history, but also presumably knowingly are eliding truth at best by saying these journals do not censor new science or scientific disagreements. Now, you know, what, what could you call an editorial decision to publish this and not that, a form of censorship, even if it really was not? You could, and you might be wrong, right? So there is going to be gray area where actually that's not what our journal does. Or that's not within the purview of, you know, that's not within the scope of this journal is a completely legitimate thing for a journal to, uh, to, to say. And that does not make what that journal is engaging in censorship. But we also know, we have seen, especially in these last two years, uh, through, through COVID to we're closing in on two and a half now. Gosh, yeah. Um, how many times articles have actually either been en route to publication, having gone through peer review successfully, um, or even having been published, and then they're, then they're retracted. And that actively looks like censorship. Yeah, I mean, it clearly is censorship. Right. Um, for those who want an example, the McCullough and Rose paper, which had passed peer review, was headed to publication, and then suddenly was unpublished by... Yeah. The publisher is a great one, and I'm not like in that case. I, I'm not sure retracted is technically the right term, but it, you know, at, at some level, it doesn't matter. Right. What happened? Uh, you know, they played by all the rules that you know we in science are supposed to play by when we're trying to get published, and those rules are increasingly stacked against those who speak truth that doesn't match <coughs> what the mainstream narrative says. Despite that, and despite the fact that what they were writing about did not match the mainstream narrative, they got through it, but then they didn't. Then they got sidelined. So if you go back to that sentence that you read that basically says papers are not being censored yep. by journals, yep. that is again... And they're talking it, about particular journals, but... Yeah. It is a totally predictable... That argument is necessary. 
right? Yes. It has to be made. It has no and informational... And untestable. Right. The, the basic point is, look, if it were true that there were censorship, and then you could say, well, there's a bunch of censorship. We're not in favor of scientific censorship. We don't like censorship. Right. So the point is, yeah. well, no, there has to be an argument that rolls its eyes and says there is no censorship. It's not censorship, right? Mm -hmm. That will be there no matter what. It would be there if it were true. It would be there if it's false. It's a non-informational sentence. There it is. Yep. But it does begin to point. So the thing about Orwell that always troubled me, that now doesn't trouble me at all having lived through the last few years, is that it was too stark to be real. Mm -hmm. The inversion of language was cartoonish. It was absurd. Yeah. And I thought, he's making a point by overdrawing it. Mm -hmm. And that's a little unfortunate. And now I'm, it's like, no, I'm watching the complete inversion of reality. He was telling us what was going to happen, and it was impossible to see if he hadn't lived it, which is part of why people from the Soviet Union and elsewhere mm -hmm. have contacted us and said, uh, you should know what that is you're seeing. We've seen it before. Yeah. Um, so in, in yes, some it, sense, yes, it can happen here is is one of the things we hear. Right. And I'm, you know, and this mm -hmm. is another thing people have said to us so many times. They've heard our story, our mm -hmm. personal story, and they were polite and quiet about it. They assumed we must be exaggerating. Mm. Maybe that's not the worst human fault. And then they encounter it and they contact us and they say, whoa, you weren't exaggerating. If anything, you were downplaying it, which mm -hmm. we were because we were trying to be cautious. Yeah. Um, so I guess the rather complete vindication of Orwell is a, an amazing fact. And mm -hmm. here you're seeing it in real time in a scientific context.